introduction. And thanks to President Tetsuzo Yasunari and the other members of the organizing committee of this 14th Biennial Commons Conference and to the organizing committee, uh, other, other members of the organizing committees. The, and and uh, I want to also acknowledge the advisors to the organizers, Meg McKean, who you just heard, and uh, Tomoyo Akumichi. I'd like to thank the Onshiran Regional Public Organization and the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature and all the others who have made this marvelous meeting possible. This has been just wonderful. So thank you very much. I'm going to talk today about the ideas of tragedies and comedies of the commons and perhaps other dramas of the commons. And the idea of the tragedy of the commons is a central one to much of resource management and environmental science. And I will, well, I will present a Newfoundland case of that. Um, I also note that our organization is founded on critiques of this idea of tragedy of the commons. And so I will talk about those critiques as an introduction to another notion. If we want to use big words, meta narratives, why not comedies of the commons? And in relationship to that, I will also talk about changing around the, uh, the centrality of the idea of market failure, which we hear about, we heard about yesterday in the other keynote, and think about if there are market failures, perhaps there are also community failures that we need to be looking at. Um, this might will point to the importance of, and the centrality to the work of this group, of self-governed, small-scale, common property resource systems. And this is, of course, what Eleanor Ostrom is most famous for, her work in governing the commons and others, other contributions she's made. I will talk about a case uh, uh, I've done research in Baja, California, that exemplifies some of those, some of the features of self-governed, small-scale CPRs. And I'll use the term CPR here, by the way, to refer to common property resources, not common pool resources. So I will talk about community failure. I uh, will give a Newfoundland case for that. And then uh, I will going to end with a discussion of ecosystem-based management and adaptive governance. And I will refer briefly to research that I'm doing now in the mid-Atlantic area in the United States and particularly to the work of Doug Wilson, who just received an award from the Society for his work, his contributions to the Society, and is not able to be with us today. So that's my plan, and here are some of my conclusions. Uh, one is that tragedies of the commons, which do occur, can be caused by both market failure and community failure. Number two, comedies of the commons are real, and they're important, but they too can be threatened by outside forces, climate change, globalization, markets, and so forth, as, as well as by privatization. And the third one, third of the conclusions that I hope to leave you with is the importance of ecosystem-based management, but also how it creates very real scale and integration challenges. At the same time, it also creates openings for more creative and adaptive governance of the commons. And I will I hope to have time to raise a question about whether we should be using these narratives about tragedies or comedies or whatever, or let facts speak for themselves, and the importance of specifying what is actually happening, the institutions involved, and so forth. And maybe the central question is to better understand the conditions under which people respond to signals of environmental change in ways that are corrective rather than making <coughs> things worse. So, here's the model that we, we are responding to in many ways, we grow up with, is an icon of our work, and this is uh, the way it may be representative, represented in fisheries, where we have both uh, effort and yield, and we have, a, the more effort you put into something, the more yield, and then there's a declining slope as the yield gets less and less, the more effort you put into it. And that's one of the beginnings of a tragedy of the commons. This is the open access commons. And then we have the costs that intersect with the yield. 
And the point at which the coughs intersect with the heel is the point at which the tragedy begins. This is the tragedy of open access, when there is no, nothing to prevent effort from increasing in response to some kind of resource availability. Now then, we, but we can find another point here, which we would see as perhaps socially more desirable, where we're getting more yield from the resource on a sustainable basis, the point of maximum sustainable yield. And then if we looked at the point at which perhaps we have the largest distance between costs and yield, the highest profitability, it might be a very different point on this curve. So this sets up the, uh, the kind of paradigm for understanding the open access commons and then the reasons for wanting to regulate the commons, either by state regulation or, letting, or, or changing the conditions of the commons and property rights to let markets take over. So this is the open access problem, and it is one we recognize and we can see in our own experiences. My own interests lead me to make choices that work against the longer term interests of both me and others in my community. And even if I know this, given the structure of an open access system, I have little reason to change because others are likely to take what I would have taken or they're likely to do what I would have done. <coughs> And here's a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine that kind of shows what this is like in fisheries, which is, at fisheries is where you can find open access commons all over the place. And the old uh, community development slogan, if you, if you give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, if you teach a man a fish, you'll feed him for a lifetime, works out a little differently in a very competitive fishery, where if you teach a man a fish, you're really stupid because you've got more competition. So this is the background for the understanding of tragedy of the commons as market failure, where and by market failure we're referring to the existence of no property rights or imperfect and poorly defined property rights that makes it difficult for markets to work to try to, to provide incentives to come out with the, uh, the best results. So the incentives are perverse and we have the opposition between what is rational for the individual and what might be socially or ecologically rational. And so we need to correct this, as we know, by government regulation of the commons or by enclosing the commons and providing more defined and exclusive property rights that enable market forces to, to function. And there are assumptions behind this that can be and should be looked at very carefully. One of them is that this is the activity of methodological individualism, where we do see individual choice and action as the basis of our social systems. It's a kind of reductionism that is, 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 can be disputed in social theory. And the other one is, of course, that we're dealing with fully rational and self-interested individuals. And where uh, the self-interest is, is where one's own preferences are primary. Rationalist is, by the way, simply the notion of some kind of consistent relationship between goals and actions, but it's the self-interestedness that is uh, most problematic in the assumptions here. There are other assumptions that are part of this way of understanding the commons, that the resources are in fact finite and predictable, that we have complete and accurate information, that the resource users are pretty much the same, that the major goal is to maximize profits, and that there are, there are no interactions among the resource users except competition, and therefore no capacity to change how things are done. And our critique, this is the critique upon which the, the, um, the International Association was founded, is, for example, based upon correcting these assumptions and saying that we know that there are unpredictable and changing systems. They are not always finite and predictable. That uh, information is, is, is wrought with uncertainty and the risk of being wrong. And that people are, in fact, quite, quite different in, in preferences and in position vis-a-vis -vis the resources and that power is really important. And that we have goals besides maximizing profits we, minimizing losses can be extremely important in many situations and ensuring livelihoods. That, and then that the interactions among the resource users include cooperation and that there are shared histories and futures. 
And that finally, there, there is the capacity and the ability of users of the commons and others to adapt and to govern common resources. A fundamental assumption of the, the tragedy of the commons model is that there is no place for community. But we do know that there are communities and that community starts with communication as this next cartoon, which is taken from an Indiana University publication that was at the time talking about Eleanor Ostrom's early work indicates. Now playing tragedy of the commons. I'm here in Latin style. So, and here's a reminder of some of the um, things that we have to be careful of in our talk, talking about the commons and understanding them. One is that there is a difference between common property and common pool. Common pool is a particular kind of resource. Common property is a particular set of social relationships about resources, not the resources themselves. The second one is common property is not the same thing as open access. Open access is where there are no property, um, property relationships, no property institutions. Common property is an institution. And open access is not a necessary and sufficient cause of tragedies of the commons. There are many other things involved in causing resource decline, <coughs> poverty, and other outcomes of tragedies <coughs> of the commons. And finally, private property is not a necessary and sufficient solution to tragedies of the commons, and we heard about that in a very interesting way yesterday. So this, these are just some of the old um, points that many of us have tried to make and, and to, make, to clarify, at least for ourselves, what we're talking about. Common property means different kinds of property rights, not their absence. And in much of the early literature, the economic literature in particular, the term common property is used as a gloss for any open access condition. And this fundamental notion that under some conditions, common pool resource users can and will cooperate for common interests. And one of the ways they will do that is to work together to change the governing institutions. That they can indeed create common property. And here's a, a, an old diagram of an English manor system which, it, which just exemplifies the existence of much far more complex systems for managing common resources, including the common pasture upon which the original early 19th century notion of, of the tragedy of the commons was um, created. So here we go with this. We're gonna, if tragedy of the commons is such a popular idea, we have, this, we have another way of talking that maybe we can make popular as well, at least get people to think differently about what's going on with the commons. And under this approach, we're thinking, accepting that people are problem solvers as well as problem creators. And they're not exogenous to the system, not outside the system, out there plotting how they're going to use their pasture, but they're part of it. And that they're engaged in efforts to protect and restore as well as to exploit and to use. People and not as tragic individuals, but as so social beings trying to deal with and correct problems that they that confront them. And so we use this old encyclopedia definition of comedy, Greek comedy, to exemplify that. The drama of humans as social rather than private beings. A drama of social actions having a frankly corrective purpose. And one example of this is in my own research in fisheries is found in, in Baja, California with the fishery cooperatives, which are in very many ways similar to the Japanese cooperatives, fishery cooperatives. Small scale artisanal fisheries, a relatively small number, in this case 80 to 150 members per cooperative, and they have exclusive rights to uh, valuable species within demarcated areas. They also belong to a larger federation, and they, in many ways, exemplify the design principles identified by Meg McKean, Eleanor Ostrom, and, and quite a few others. And here I show a map on the upper left 
of the, uh, the in red of the concessions that, that, uh, that are uh, belong to different cooperatives. The cooperatives are named here and they exist in towns that are close to these concessions. Within those concessions, the cooperatives hold exclusive use rights to lobster, abalone, and several other valuable species. The rest of these pictures are just showing other elements of the cooperatives. The, uh, the officials are members of the cooperative, get elected for one or two terms, and rotate through the offices of, of power, power positions. People work in the processing plants as well as on the boats, and they work in a very, very rich um, ecosystem. So, in studying this particular system, we found that uh, some, some of the points that Ostrom has made about self-governed common pool resource and common property systems are, uh, make sense. One is that if improvement of the resource is feasible, it's not a situation where it's gotten so depleted and so diminished that it's very hard to muster the basic resources one needs to make improvements. And this is a case in this case. It's a very rich ecosystem. Um, it's, a, it's an upwelling system in, ocean, in oceanography terms. And um, it had not been depleted greatly. At the time that people began to organize to try to control the lobster fishery and the abalone fisheries. They also, and this is really important as you, many of you know, to, for viable comments is to be able to see and to be able to determine what is actually going on in the system. And in this, in, for lobster and abalone in relatively shallow waters, it is possible to actually go down and look, to dive, and to see, to count, to monitor, and to become, come up with uh, relatively affordable or inexpensive indicators that you can rely on to know what is actually happening and to know whether or not it makes what your efforts to manage the resource have made a difference. The resources themselves are relatively predictable, and the system itself is small enough for accurate knowledge of boundaries and, and, the, and the environment. Uh, those, those concessions are not terribly large, and so the people who work in them have a very good understanding of what is within the concessions. And there are attributes not only of the resource, but also of the, what Ostrom called the appropriators, the resource users, that also would, were found in this case and can be found in others as well. Uh, how dependent they are, how important it is, this resource is to them, is important. Whether they have a common understanding of how it works and how their actions affect each other and affect the resource system. Whether they have a long time, time horizon, whether, whether it matters to them that the next generation benefits or not. The existence of some levels of trust and, and reciprocity as well as autonomy, the ability of people within their local cooperatives to make decisions that uh, on their own as well as work together with government as they do in this case. It's a co-managed system with government and, then, and the importance of experience and leadership, very important. And there, so those are factors that seem to have made a difference to the cooperatives in Baja California which have received certification by the Marine Stewardship Council as um, which allows them to, to claim the label of Marine Stewardship Council as, as having sustainable lobster fisheries. They were the first artisanal fishery in the world to receive this certification. They had it renewed and um, they were also the first Latin American fishery. But we also know from that case and others that it's, we have to go beyond, we have to understand that these local systems are nested, embedded in, in larger political regimes, in larger ecosystems, and larger markets as well. And, so it's, and, there, and there are other factors that are important, contextual ones that make a difference to, to the, the effectiveness of these local systems. And the last one here I'll draw your attention to is importance that that um, there's formal recognition by, by governments of the, of the monitoring and sanctioning work of the local authorities and back up to them in the judicial system and policing and so forth. Of what was once one of the greatest, largest fish populations in the world. And this could be analyzed as community failure, the, in, in terms of the local communities and their, the lack of capacity they had 
to respond to what they saw as decline in the size of the fish they were catching, the scarcity of fish in their local fishing grounds, and so forth. But it was community failure in the larger sense in this case because the local communities could not speak to the, the matter because the power was within the government and the government scientists were working with faulty models and under particular political and economic conditions that made it impossible for them to recognize that or to admit that the problems in their models um, were not only real but should translate into corrective policy. So the result was too many fish were being taken even though people knew better. And um, a lot of, of a, a very tragic situation for 30,000 people who lost their jobs. And this is a case where there were questions about the scope and scale of management. Could local communities make a difference when the cod migrate and so forth? There were many questions like that and lots of issues about who was to blame. But, but there was another matter that also occurred that has gotten less attention and that is the aftermath. What did people do in response? And what they did was they diversified and they diversified into other fisheries. But one of them is the shrimp fishery, and for that fishery, which is offshore, they have to use draggers, which are dragnets, which uh, actually do touch the, the bottom of the ocean, and they attempt to get shrimp, and they also have what is called bycatch, lots of other, of other fish that they'll catch, or small, small fish and large fish caught in their nets. And so, um, one of the things I'm portraying this as an example of a problem that comes up often where there are unintended consequences of the decisions that we do make. And that can lead to serious folly. And there's a possibility that this fishery is indeed a folly for the people of Newfoundland that has taken them in the wrong direction, even though it too got certification by the Marine Stewardship Council as a sustainable fishery. But there, is now, there are now serious questions about the effect of this fishery and the technology used on the capacity of other fisheries, crab and cod, to restore. And that leads me to the importance of an ecosystem approach. And I think much of our early work in the, on the commons was focused on particular resources and, and, and fairly narrowly defined. And certainly that's the case in fisheries where um, all of the government systems of management are focused on single species and many of much of our own attention has been given to single species or a few species but we all recognize that we're talking about complex ecosystems and so we in the importance of therefore anticipating protecting against unintended consequences externalities side effects and so forth and for that as you know we come up with notions such as um, Austrian socio-ecological systems, and many of you are engaged in trying to, um, you know, make that a, an important, um, a, um, important tool for for analysis, and notions of resilience and vulnerability, and also this idea of coupled natural and human systems. And Austrian's work on polycentric governance is very, very appropriate to these top questions about ecosystem. E ecosystem scale and, eco and the complexity of ecosystems, as well as more global questions. So here I'd like to bring to your attention the work of, of Doug Wilson, who, uh, who has written a book called The Paradoxes of Transparency, which is about his research at, a, at an institution that we wouldn't think of as a commons institution, perhaps. It's the International Commission for um, International Council for Exploration of the Seas. It was the first global environmental governance institution in the world. And it was created in the late 1800s. And it is now the uh, forum within which most of European fisheries science and management is conducted. And so he's tried, he studied this in an effort to better understand commons management and adaptive governance where ecosystem management is increasingly important. And he's done this, bringing into, into the, um, the, the mix of methods and theory that we are using in Commons research, sociology of science. Because what we really are talking about in so many cases is knowledge, knowledge, the scale of knowledge, the sources of knowledge, the production of knowledge, 
uh, the contested knowledge, shared knowledge, all these issues, are, knowledge is so extremely important. As I mentioned before about the Baja California uh, case in Mexico, it's really important that the fishers are able to know something about the abalone and the lobster that they're dealing with. And it's really hard in the, in the Newfoundland case for people to see the cod and to re really understand it. You know, our, the, the nature of the resources itself can make a difference to our ability to manage them. Well, knowledge, in, but how do we know? And, and, and how can we convince others of what we know and that what we know is the right, is, and how can we be sure that we know the right thing so we know what to do? So that's this, and so the sociology of science is extremely important to, to this. And this gets into these big issues of scale and uncertainty and knowledge that uh, we see, I think, in all of the cases, and particularly now with climate change. What Wilson has brought to this in a very thorough and systematic way is social theory, particularly his favorite, which is the theory of Jürgen Habermas, and a focus on communication. And earlier I mentioned how important communication is to the general critique of Commons research. And here he's look, beginning to look at it in a much more focused manner and the importance of deliberation and discourse and the value of so-called rational communication, of open, constructive discussion on the commons, and how important that is in ways to handle like the free rider problem, you know, an open discussion where everyone has a say as a way to at least reduce the chances that some people are going to just benefit from the behavior of others and, and cheat. And so, and, 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 and understanding that even in our small-scale commons, as well as these very large-scale ones, such as ICs, we have, to, we have to recognize that there are many different mechanisms of so-called governing mechanisms that, make a, that play upon what people finally conclude and what they do. Money is very, very important. Political power, prestige, authority, just social interactions, influence, and so forth. All of these are really important to affect um, what people say, what they accept as true, and what they're going to base their decisions on. And so, it highlighted here is the importance of finding forums, finding ways that people can be much more frank and honest and really discuss the matter with setting aside uh, personal influence and power, money, and so forth. And how important it is to have shared assumptions um, and, 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 and learn each other's language. And I think even in very small scale comments, you, you've learned this as well, but it's, and it's, it's just as important in uh, large scale systems in the European Union and other places. And so, and what, uh, we, we're looking at this, we're looking, we have a large project on climate change and a fishery in the United States for something called the surf clam. Where the, and there are some serious questions there, scale questions, whether we're talking about the whole stock over a very large region, or we're talking about smaller, uh, smaller scale stocks of clams, and whether, and that makes a big difference to management, but it also is, is where, how climate change, is. climate change is affecting clams in some places and not others, so scale becomes very important that way. We're looking at issues of science and knowledge construction and how scientists are dealing with the importance of maintaining their professional identities because that's really critical to the extent to which their, their messages will be heard but also opened up and transparent to the participation of people from the fishing industry and environmentalists who have also have much to, to say. So this whole issue that sociologists and scientists, science will talk about of boundary maintenance and so forth is very, very critical, to, in fact, to what happens in these arguments. But looking for the places and times in which there really is rational communication as opposed to the times when that's sort of set aside and, 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 and interest um, and legal authority and money play. It's one of the things that we're doing in the research that we have on this very coupled system of uh, the dynamic ecosystem shown on the far left, the clams, the clamors, the technology, the 
processing plants, the workers, the clam meats, and uh, Vani, the clam chowder that we love to eat. And we've studied how committees are working on this, how the research team works, interdisciplinary work, how the oceanographers communicate with anthropologists, <coughs> how do researchers from universities communicate with government scientists and with people from the industry. And the, the whole information flow process, which, which goes into stock assessment, which is a central action that then leads to decisions by managers. And I'm not going to go into the details of that because I'm sure you are not, um, you don't care about what happens to the Atlantic surf clam as much as I do. But, um, if, you know, you have to know one to like one. But anyway, we're, you know, questions, some of the basic questions like, how do you know what's true and what's not true? And when you're in a meeting, how is that negotiated? And what kinds of languages do make a difference? And which languages are people, people most comfortable using and which are most effective in persuading others? How important are graphs and charts and numbers versus anecdotal uh, evidence and stories that people have to say? And how do those, how do those get negotiated? Uh, how does Collegiality will work out and everybody is, is in it together, but some people actually are lawyers working for industry and other people are scientists working for government and trying to be work together really closely but recognizing that they have very, very different backgrounds and interests and so forth. So this is just an example of how one might be, begin to look at um, these larger enterprises, large-scale commons, more complex commons, and ecosystem-based management. And, and join in what is actually a large-scale effort to come up with more adaptive or improved governance of these large-scale systems that we have for fisheries, forests, climate, and so forth. And these are big challenges, particularly at the global scale and regional scale. And here we get back into a paradox that Doug Wilson has identified very, I think, very well. And that is, um, we're talking usually about large spatial scopes and fairly complex systems where you do need centralized decision making. For, you have to have multidisciplinary expertise. You have to have ways to manage data, accumulation of knowledge. And you have to bring together experts to analyze the, the information. You have to have agencies coordinating their actions and so forth. So it's that, all, that whole spectrum of, of government and large-scale institutions that are very important to to global problems, to regional um, ecosystem problems. But at the same time, and this is, I think, where the traditional focus that we have on, on the commons as, as originating in place and community really is central, and that is that we do need to have more decentralized and more participatory uh, methods to, to function within ecosystem management. You have to be able to work across multiple scales and monitor and capture detailed knowledge about ecological and social processes only available at this local place-based level. Be able to then move from local to global scales. So, just to summarize briefly that, as I said at the beginning, um, tragedies of the commons do happen. And these can be caused by market failure, or the in, you know, in lack of property rights, or in, incomplete property rights, or however you want to phrase that. But also because of communities and factors that affect their capacity to deal with the commons, and to, um, to also to have the autonomy and the other resources they need to, to uh, function. Comedies of the commons are real. They build upon and support communities. Also here, and I haven't emphasized this, but they are threatened very much by, by the large-scale forces that we deal with. And I think I know there are papers given here about this, these matters. Climate change, also what happens when communities become much more dependent on outside markets. And, um, and, and then, of course, by the, the extraordinary wave of neoliberalism that has changed so much of our world. The privatization that goes with that. And then ecosystem management creates um, scale and integration challenges that are dazzling and you know, 
um, bewildering too, but also I think openings for creative and adaptive governance that do importantly require the engagement of local communities. And, but to conclude though, I think that there are some risks of playing with the language of tragedies of the commons and comedies of the commons, romances of the commons, whatever you want to say, using these, these, these terms, because they, they signify models that um, may, may mislead us, and it's just a, kind of a, a lesson about doing, doing good science, that we need to look carefully at the facts, think about the questions we're asking and whether they're appropriate questions, um, Letting, letting, trying to understand what is actually happening. And, I, and I, I try myself in my work to get back to the basics. And I think, for me, the basic has to do with how people are responding to the signals that they get about what's about changes in their environments. And then, what is it that causes them to, if they sense change, to do something about it? And that, that language of negative and positive feedback actually fits into the coupled systems framework that some people like to use these days. But really, it's, it's much more simple than that. What is it, and what is it that makes it possible for people to work together to, to deal with the issues of commons that they, they live with and they depend upon? And what is it that leads them to agree to take on some of the sacrifices that they need to take to make things better for themselves and for the future? And what is it that maybe leads them to, to decide to, they're going to opt for the, the short-term solutions and let the long-term take care of itself? So these are, these, are, these are questions that we can ask in all of the places where we do research. Um, some of the, the theories about the commons may be helpful to us and they should be part of, our, of what we are, what we bring to these questions. But we also have to try to find ways to let the people themselves speak for themselves and to, to hear their voices too. So thank you very much for your time.